Mm -hmm. Okay, just drop me a message when I start. Yeah, it's live, and I think uh, Bijen needs to announce the chairperson, Tim Su, and also the speaker, Guyum Jack. So, yeah, we can start. Okay, thank you, Monale. Uh, good evening to one and all. I welcome you again to the fourth session of the first day of ICT Blan A2. And my greetings to our invited speaker, uh, Guyum Jack. Uh, I, I'm not very sure about what time is it with you. So our best greeting to you. So uh, without any further delay, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Temsun Sung uh, to kindly chair the uh, session of Dr. Jack. And I request to kindly introduce the speaker. Over to you, Dr. Temsun. Yeah, thank you, Bijan. Uh, so yeah, welcome to all the participants. This is the last session of the day. And uh, this is also the second invited talk uh, today. So we've had a very interesting uh, session uh, in the afternoon. And so uh, yeah, today, uh, this evening, we're very uh, privileged to have Dr. Guillaume Jacques. Uh, he's a researcher who is associated with the uh, CNRS. This is the uh, National Center for Scientific Research in Paris. Uh, so if you uh, look at his uh, works, uh, you'll see that he has his hands and feet, I think, in many places. I was just looking at his uh, works, and uh, it's not very it's not specific to uh, sino tibetan but uh, he has worked on uh, Altic languages, Indo-European languages, uh, Semitic, uh, American Indian languages, and so on. And he has done a lot of work on historical linguistics, uh, Sino-Tibetan, uh, Tibetan historical linguistics, Chinese uh, languages, uh, also worked with uh, dictionaries. So uh, we are in fact very privileged to have him with us this evening. And uh, he'll be talking uh, to us on the idiophones in Jaukuk and other Yalrongic languages. So yeah, I think I'm gonna uh, hand over the uh, rest of the time. I think uh, we have one hour. So yeah, Dr. Guillaume, you can take the time. Okay, thank you. And I'm very uh, honored to be uh, speaking today at your conference. Um, and uh, so, um, so the topic I'm, I'm going to talk about today is related to Sino-Tibetan family. It's a subgroup of uh, Sino-Tibetan that uh, presents interesting um, uh, properties in, in morphosyntax, in phonology, and also uh, in historical linguistics, which, uh, and I hope that this talk will be helpful to um, bring uh, your attention to this, uh, to the, to the Garungic languages on the one hand, and also uh, raise a discussion concerning ideal forms in general, uh, because uh, I, Garung languages happen to have very interesting um, uh, part of speech, uh, 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 ideophonic part of speech. And um, uh, one of the reasons I, I chose this topic is because I believe that in languages of Nepal and Northeastern India and uh, uh, other uh, uh, area of Northern India where Sino Tibetan languages are spoken, such as uh, yeah, Uttarakhand, uh, we, we, the, the, they also have, uh, uh, there are also ideophonic uh, ideophones, uh, languages that have ideophones as, as a part of speech. Now, I would be interested to learn more. I, I've seen that there is at least one um, uh, talk in this uh, uh, conference uh, concerning expressives. And uh, I'd like to, to be interested to know whether we find similar patterns um, um, as uh, those we, we find in Garonic languages. Uh, so uh, it's also an opportunity for all of us to discuss uh, this issue, this broader issue. Now. So before I, I delve into the matter, I, I'm going to um, make a short presentation about uh, Garonic languages since I surmise that not all of you have heard about them. So I, myself, one of my main topic of research concerns uh, a language that's called Japuk. I'll show you later where it's spoken. Uh, let me uh, put in the chat a link to uh, the 
the grammar of the book I, I, I published last year. It is freely available. Uh, I hope some of you can have a, a look and download and, and read it and read some of it at least. I also have a, a dictionary, which uh, I also put this and a, 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 um, a, a corpus of texts so that you can listen to how it sounds like. Yeah, there are uh, more uh, uh, do, uh, dozens of hours of, 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 of text could are transcribed, not all uh, translated, but at least uh, uh, for those of you who are interested, you can um, get a, a sense of how it sounds like. Yeah, although I'm going to give examples of uh, sentences, I'm going to pronounce them. So, you, but of course, it's better to have a native speaker pronouncing them. Huh? So, um, while you're listening to my presentation, I invite you to uh, uh, to um, also um, uh, so to have a look at, at these uh, uh, grammar, dictionary, and text collection, which I believe, in the spirit of Franz Boas, are a necessary and essential. Um, basis for any study of a language yeah uh, we all need the three at least these three aspects to be covered to uh, have a good description and i hope that many of you if you have not yet done it will pr produce uh, grammars dictionaries and text collections of uh, languages endangered languages of, of northern india and nepal now jarwink languages are spoken in a Tibetan area of Sichuan in China. So you can see here. So as you know, the Tibetan world in China is divided into several uh, provinces, the autonomous region, Qinghai, and uh, half of uh, Sichuan and part of Yunnan, and also Gansu, the south of Gansu. Yeah. Um, so uh, this, area uh, here. So some of you may remember that there was an earthquake in 2008, a major earth earthquake. So um, this earthquake, its epicenter is located uh, about 400 kilometers from where Gyarong language is spoken. So this is, this is uh, the, the heart of the Gyarong area. In um, the, the, this uh, big area is called Ajnawa. It's a, a district within Sichuan, the Sichuan province. And uh, this is Mbarkam, yeah, you see? Uh, uh, the, the place where uh, we have an exceptionally high linguistic diversity. So this is Mbarkam here. And this is a map that represents the Gyaronic languages. So here, um, uh, I, I didn't include all the uh, regions, so this is only um, this area here, yeah, and some neighboring uh, districts. And uh, I present the languages only under 4,000 uh, um, uh, meter of, of um, uh, 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 altitude, uh, because uh, places we, uh, uh, above 4,000 4, are only sparsely inhabited. So it gives a, a bad, uh, actually, it, it, it gives a, a, a much better um, idea of, of how languages are actually located to, to, to look at this map uh, with the altitude taken into account. Huh? So in here we see that these languages are distributed over um, valleys uh, of low altitude. Yeah? So the language on which I'm working mainly is Japhuk. It's spoken here in the north of um, Barkham. Here, what is in, in green is Ando-Tibetan, so it's, it's not a Gyaronic language. And in the south, you have Chinese in the plains, and here in the south, um, you have Qiang, the Qiang language spoken here in Heishui, in, uh, uh, in the Kruchu, and here in the Xian. So here, again, this here, rough, rough, about here, you have Qiang, in the south, you have Chinese, and in the north, you have Amdo Tibetan and all the Tibetic variety. Now, so as you can see, this Barkham, this area, is a, 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 contains six different languages, not including Chinese, which is the main uh, language of communication now, and Tibetan, which is also spoken in this area. 
So it's one of the hotspots of linguistic diversity in China. So Gallic languages are not just interesting for their diversity, they are also quite unusual as a scientific languages because they have polysynthetic morphology. I'm not going to present all of it, but we'll see some examples through the example sentences we, uh, in this presentation. And um, they are uh, very far removed from the type we, we uh, represent by Chinese, Lolo Burmese, or a language of Northeast India like Angami, for instance and closer to, uh, for instance, the Kiranti languages of Nepal, and also to some extent uh, in Northeastern India to uh, Northern Naga and Tangsa, yeah? So they are uh, very prefixing languages. That's something that's unusual among scientific languages. So uh, ideal forms have been described in detail for three Yarong languages, Tsovdun, so by Jackson Soon was the earliest uh, article. Then I wrote an article, and, and uh, uh, Lei Yunfan also uh, authored, uh, uh, described them uh, much in detail in his uh, dissertation and, and wrote a, a few papers on it on Krustyap. So, uh, one of the, the languages spoken here in blue. Yeah. So what's specific about ideophones? So first of all, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you not real ideophones, but ideophonic roots. Uh, we'll see later what it means specifically, but uh, before, so these are not real words, okay? So these are not real words, these are abstract roots that we can extract from the actual forms. And we uh, noticed a few uh, immediate things about these ideophones. So first of all, there are a certain number of, uh, of clusters, initial clusters. So Yarwink languages are known for having complex initial clusters. Yeah, unlike also very like, unlike uh, the Lulu Burmese Chinese type. Yeah, these languages have a heavy initial clusters. Yeah, uh, so in some languages like uh, Krostyap, you have up to uh, six initial consonants. So it's quite uh, daunting somehow. Uh, so it sounds a bit like Georgian in some way. Uh, in Japuk, we have at, at most three initial consonants, but still some of them are quite strange. Now, if we look at these uh, clusters, we see very strange uh, features. Let me just highlight a few, uh, a few examples. So um, first of all, we have a lot of initial uh, plain voice initial. Huh? So this is like bu 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 So this is, quite unusual in Japuk because um, uh, what, what we see in, a vocab in native vocabulary, you barely have any uh, native uh, verb root with initial voiced uh, consonants. Now you have some, uh, some are uh, possibly actually of idophonic origins. A few other are uh, from, um, from Tibetan, they are loan words, yeah? But in the native vocabulary, you, you normally don't have initial b or initial g, or you have some examples of the because when they come from L. So, um, so that's the first thing. In addition, you have clusters with an L initial, like So that's also something quite unusual in uh, Japuk. Why? Because the ancient clusters with L pre-initial uh, actually underwent a sound change whereby the L pre-initial change to Y. So for instance, if you compare the word for, uh, I, I didn't draw, write it here, but the word, I can write it in the chat. Uh, the word for um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the snow in Japuk is Teipa. Yeah, I, I, I write it in the chat. And this uh, Yipa cluster, you have here, so this is means snow, this cluster yipa. In some languages, you have lpa or lv. Yeah, so you basically have a sound change that removed the clusters l consonant, yeah, and changed them to y consonant. Now, as we can see here, the ideal forms have filled in this gap in the phonological system. That's something quite important about ideophones from a phonological perspective, 
they tend to fill the gaps in the phenological system. That raises the question of where they come from. Uh, that's something we will discuss later. Uh, so I'm not going to go into all details. Let me take another example. Drum, drum. Yeah, you have dr, this cluster. So that's this cluster also is quite un unusual in Japhook because from the comparative evidence, we see that the ancient t plus r clusters have become t, have become retroflex African. So for instance, the numeral uh, six crypto. There is direct evidence. So I, I write it in a chat. Good joke. It means uh, uh, it means six. We know that it's cognate to Tibetan druk, yeah. And we know uh, uh, quite a, uh, some languages that still have a cluster here. So it's also cognate to Chinese liu, uh, with an, an initial l which comes from an r. So we know that this had an uh, an r some state. And this is confirmed by the fact that the, the, the word uh, uh, 16 is kapr, yeah, with a, uh, I, I put it in the chat. Yes, I know it's not moving. It, it, uh, 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 the, the words I mentioned are in a chat. Yeah. So uh, I'll show the, le, 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 I'm still on this page, don't worry. So this is kapr is uh, uh, 16. Shows if you compare Kutro and Skapro, you can see that the uh, uh, oh, you, yeah, there's nothing in your chat. Oh, it's in the waiting room. Okay, sorry, I I, I didn't send uh, 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 everyone in meeting. Okay, sorry. So Kutro and Skapro, yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, this, uh, uh, by internal reconstruction, we can see that this tr cluster comes from tr. So then the sound chain removed all the tr in the, in the system. Yeah. So when we see a, something like drum, 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 yeah, uh, we, we see a cluster that shouldn't exist anymore because all these clusters have been removed. So it, it's also in a case of slot filling effect of ideal fields. Uh, that's something. Uh, I, I want to um, uh, I want you to think about in your languages are there cases of slot filling of ideal forms filling in gaps in a phonological system? Yeah, so that's something we can discuss later. Another thing you can see just by looking at these um, examples. So here uh, yeah, there are two slides. Yeah. Um, one thing is the meanings of these roots. Some are very specific, you know. Um, um, in general, uh, like uh, uh, so, some some like stupid. Maybe uh, I, I translated with one um, word, but a lot of these um, um, uh, ideal form express a complex meaning that you can only convey with a, a paraphrase in most languages. Yeah? You rarely have specific word with exactly the same meaning. And they are not indispensable to convey meaning, but when it comes to telling, uh, to be eloquent in the language and being able to tell a story that vividly, yeah, uh, they, they, they enter into uh, use and they come into use and they are quite important to speak nicely in the language. So I am sure you also know in the languages you, you studied examples of ideal forms and their use in narratives and also in conversation. And uh, uh, not every speaker is able to use them to their full extent. Yeah, But I think there is a, a, a quite a big difference between native and non-native speaker when it comes to using these ideal forms. Personally, I, I'm completely unable to use them. I, I, uh, I only have, uh, uh, I only use the most common of them when I uh, speak Japuk because uh, they, they require very fine grain understanding of uh, uh, the um, meaning, um, slides, uh, slides of meaning. Yeah? Yeah. So you can also see a very unusual cluster like yeah? 
with uh, a palatal and a g, which has no possible origin in proto dialogic So uh, these, these are, are quite interesting phenomena. Now, where do these abstract roots come from? Yeah, they don't exist normally, uh, not at least not for all uh, cases. In all cases, normally you have uh, what well, I wrote them with a big R. You have ten idiophonic patterns. Yeah, idiophone come in uh, these patterns that which look a little bit like the patterns we have in Semitic languages. You know, uh, so some of them are concatenative. Just for instance, reduplication. I think that's completely pretty universal in ideophonic uh, morphology that you have reduplication, and some have uh, you know partial reduplication. So, for instance, xiang, which means to be high, xiang is similar effective. We'll see an example later, and you have example as xiang na long, where you replace the uh, in onset of the second uh, uh, second. Uh, 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 of the reduplicated syllable, yeah. Sometimes you have prefix-like elements. Uh, they're not really prefixes in the sense that it's it's difficult to uh, identify a specific meaning, yeah. And uh, it's not really uh, directional morphology as we usually think of it. Um, but well, we can call them prefixal elements. We have also a, a, a partial reduplication involving the the coda, yeah, xiang, xiang and yi. So we repeat the coda and add some vowels. Yeah? Uh, okay, so you have these, uh, and uh, you have uh, uh, um, several shades of meanings that we'll go into more detail later. Now, there is also a question of uh, the relationship between ideophones and onomatopoeia. Yeah, so um, it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, I, I'll, I'm not sure we'll have time to, to say it. There is overlap between the two uh, uh, categories. So a lot of ideophones uh, describe a sound. So we have some examples here, like for instance, um, gurgle, it's definitely uh, expresses a sound, but many of them hitting noise, glue, yeah, describe the sound. But a lot of them express either um, something that you can feel visually, yeah, but not uh, audi uh, uh, auditorily, yeah? The for instance, long, thin, flexible hanging, um, like, uh, for instance, the, the, um, the branches of, of the willow, yeah? Uh, so you see, th these are not things that have are, uh, are normally related to a sound, yeah? It's mainly visual, auditory, and to some extent, sometimes taste also and touch. Yeah, so we have examples like um, uh, rough, yeah, uh, rough surface, yeah. Brz, brz. So this is definitely touch. So it's generally uh, used with verbs expressing touch. So uh, the idea forms from a semantic point of view express a variety of senses, uh, of uh, sensations from all the senses, and only some of them are. Uh, auditory, yeah, and at the same time you have a real onomatopoeia that don't go into the nine audiophonic patterns. So let's see how they really work. So the pattern one expressed in example uh, one, ziang jotonzur, uh, so expresses a semifactive uh, event, yeah, and uh, uh, so here ziang means to be tall, and if when it appears in this pattern, it expresses uh, suddenly appearing tall, a meaning like that. Yeah? And it requires a verb to be used with it. Yeah, so here it's the aorist of stand up. The patterns, pattern two, plain reduplication. So it expresses a state. Yeah, so uh, so this is from a real story. Yeah. They piled up something. And so that the result of this piling activity was that the, um, uh, it was a, a thatch. The thatch became piled up very high. Yeah. So here it, it, it expresses a resultative state. Yeah. Uh, and here, uh, also, 
So it refers to the way the body of a jackal looks like. Yeah. Uh, so again, it's difficult to translate it in a precise way with one or two words. Um, but when you, when anyone who saw a jackal can guess what it means. Yeah. Uh, but it's difficult to translate. Okay. So now. Uh, th uh, the pattern three, pattern three with a no in, in, in the middle, this no um, occurs with normal nouns. Yeah, it's probably possibly of Tibetan origin, no in Tibetan. Uh, and it's, it, it, it expresses um, uh, so alternation between two things. Yeah. Uh, so, for instance, you look left and then right, and uh, repeatedly you could use this no. Uh, to express that with nouns. Um, now, uh, so when you have a root and you have this now in the middle, then it, it expresses not a state, but a, a process, yeah? Um, so here, for instance, typically with motion verbs, that's what you will get, yeah? Yeah? And uh, you can also reduplicate it more, so here, you have the possibility of rather than repeating it once to repeating two times. So uh, So uh, uh, so running, coming, running with big strides. Yeah. Uh, and also look at this example. It, it illustrates the prefixing verbal template of Japuk. Don't commit suicide. You see neg negation, prohibitive, imperative, second person, reflexive. Yeah. So that's typical of also uh, Garongic languages to have uh, an extremely prefixing verbal template. Uh, uh, most morphology is on the verb, and the verb indexes, at least uh, it can index two arguments. Yeah. So that's also something quite uh, important in these languages. Um, OK. And then you have this pattern with the replacement of the initial consonant by an L, Xiang the Lang Ninke. So what's the meaning here? This uh, pattern four, it express an action that, um, so uh, as a disorderly fashion uh, with uh, 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 typically, you can imagine someone who is walking uh, and who be, uh, uh, as he walks, his body becomes taller and uh, and uh, shorter. Uh, he has a, a, a pace, and uh, his whole body uh, go, goes up and down. Yeah, I, I don't know if I I, I can't find the exact way uh, to express this, but so, some people who have difficulty walking can work like that. Uh, a bit like um, also, it could apply to the motion of of uh, some birds. You know that. Uh, keep uh, uh, shaking their head uh, because of their eye, actually, the, the way they have to fix. Uh, um, and, and, and so you, you, when you, you listen to a sentence like this, you can imagine a, a person who walks and raise their head and then, uh, um, um, uh, then uh, have their head come down again uh, repeatedly. Yeah. So you see the kind of shades of meaning is bidimensional. You have the meanings conveyed by the ideophonic root itself, which um, is not always specified for um, aspect. Yeah, and you have the um, uh, the ideophonic pattern, which specify the aspect of the ideophonic event uh, of the event. Uh, conveyed by these idiophonic words. So I'm not going to go too much into detail in the rest. Uh, so here there are examples of pziang, mala ziang, ziang ngi. So ziang ngi slowly, expressing a slow motion. And some of them are, are quite fun. So shkwe shkawi here. Ne ngurish uh, tunze tia kurezi nisti nuchu arandandet. Shkwe shkawi nisi spa. Okay, so. It means it expresses how ants go into 
um, uh, trees and eat it from the inside and make holes everywhere. And here we have this pattern eight, here I mentioned here, but pattern eight. Uh, also a stative pattern, uh, meaning a lot and in disorder, and it expresses this one, uh, with big nostrils. So that's a meaning it can, can have. If you have if you have it in, for instance, pattern two, it generally is interpreted as having big nostrils. But when it appears in pattern eight, then the uh, uh, interpretation is full of holes. So that's an example where it can appear with um, um, uh, like um, uh, trees, dead trees that have been eaten up from the insides by some uh, insects. Yeah. Um, and you see that, so thus the ideal forms don't appear by themselves. Yeah. They have to, generally, they have to occur with verbs. So it can be stative verbs like nirkat, can be also verbs like uh, go or become. So become is almost a, um, uh, an, uh, uh, an, an auxiliary here, but also more specific verbs like make holes. Yeah. So here you see nisispa. Yeah, it's actually the causative with the uh, sigmatic prefix s that uh, so, so some of you who've done study Tibet may know about. Yeah, and uh, the verb kospa, which means have a hole. Yeah. Okay, now, so it's not the full story. So you, you, you have several choices you can make. How do you use ideophic roots in Jepuk? Yeah, you can use ideophones as uh, adverb-like uh, 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 forms, yeah? So, but you already see that in a way they have, the, the, because they have these patterns, yeah? Ideal forms constitute a specific, uh, there, there are morphological, there is morphological evidence for postulating a specific part of speech, ideal forms in language. It's not always the case. There are many languages where uh, ideal form may not be a very um, useful concept, yeah? It might, may not be extremely uh, useful to distinguish them from the rest of the vocabulary, um, yeah, uh, because you don't have morphological or, or very clear uh, morphosyntactic evidence for perceiving them. Uh, you just have the fact that some uh, words are ideophonic like uh, or, or, or nomatio uh, poetic like, or that they have unusual phonotactics, but that's not enough. Uh, so we, we've seen that here. You can, uh, in Japan, you can identify ideal independently of their phonotactics. So phonotactics often happens to be strange in the phones, not always, but you can identify, identify them because they can enter into these patterns. Although not all roots are compatible with all patterns. It's not completely predictable. It, it depends, there are constraints, uh, semantic constraints and pragmatic constraints on how you can make them, and also sometimes the, the patterns are not, the meaning of these patterns is not completely predictable. Yeah. It's not com completely compositional. Yeah. I mean, the, the combination between the meaning of the uh, definite root and the meaning of the pattern, the way they combine together. Now, another interesting thing is that you have a choice in how you want to deal with these roots. So you can, you know, you use uh, the uh, ideal forms with, for instance, normal verbs or with auxiliary. So here you have an auxiliary, a dictic verb, costu, which means to do like uh, something, simulative uh, verb, which, um, so is transitive and often used with ideal forms to express uh, the most basic meaning of the ideal forms, the, the ideal form in a, a active meaning. Yeah? So, caprik plan a So, what it means is the snake um, uh, uh, points out its, its, its flicking its tongue. So, its tongue is, uh, you know, moving. Uh, the the bifid tongue is, is, is moving. Uh, that's specifically used to express this meaning. Yeah? Possibly all the four, uh, maybe you could perhaps, I'm not too sure, use this idea of forms with uh, 
when you play with uh, strings and you do a motion similar to that of the tongue of the of the snake, but otherwise it's quite specifically used for that. So it's also quite limited uh, the range of use of, of this ideal form. So you see here, you have the, the root pla, and it occurs with the, so pla is not unusual from the point of view of uh, phonotactics. This one is not very strange. And then you have this um, na element and you have so pattern three. So it's perfectly natural. It's, uh, it expresses a, a process and not a state and not a semifactive ac action. Yeah, so it's, it's perfectly uh, what you would expect. Now, you can express the same meaning uh, by deriving a de-ideal phonic verb. Yeah? And how do you do that? Then you do that by adding a prefix, a denominal prefix, actually. You have the same set of prefixes to derive denominal verbs. So I'm not going to enter in too much detail, but if you're interested, you can uh, see them in um, uh, the Japu grammar. Uh, I put in a chat that some, someone copied the links. Um, yeah, you, you can uh, have a look at it. It's an entire chapter on denominal verbalizing prefixes, which is one uh, major uh, category of the verbal system in Gerlang languages, and not something very usual inside Tibetan, actually. Um, and so you use similar looking prefixes. Uh, to express this meaning. So you can express the same meaning with g, which derives an intransitive verb, yeah? So, or with the prefix so, which derives a transitive one, yeah? So, capri k, so with ergative, here capri, capri so snake, <coughs> is the <coughs> transitive subject, like in a, it receives ergative case. The object is to the tongue of the, of, the, of the snake. And so here, instead of using the uh, um, a pattern four, a three idea phone with the verb stu to do uh, like, the similarity verb, you use this verb <coughs> with simple reduplication and a directional sub prefix. And you also have the option of using the intransitive verb, the snake's tongue is flicking, yeah? Where the snake is not a transitive subject anymore, it's the possessor of the tongue, and you replace the ergative by the genitive, and then the resulting verb is intransitive. And it's, it's intransitive subject is the tongue, yeah? So <coughs> you can't do that <coughs> with all ideal forms, yeah? But it's relatively pr productive. Yeah, the full extent of productivity. Uh, I've tried to study it in a in a way I, I, as um, uh, thoroughly as I could, and um, actually I haven't finished doing that. Someday, uh, some I should write a, a larger uh, study of ideal forms in Japuk. But uh, at least uh, so so. It has to be specified in an ideophone per ideophone basis. Now, so that, that's the next thing I wanted to talk about, the ideophonic verbs. Now, another interesting thing is the issue of consonantal gradation. And that's perhaps the, the issue I'd, I'd like most to know about in languages of India and Nepal. Namely, are there languages with ideophones in the languages you know that have consonantal gradation. So that's something that's well known from languages of Northern America. Uh, they are known, as, for instance, in, um, in Suan languages. Yeah. So for instance, uh, some of you may know the names of some states, uh, Minnesota. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, this Minnesota is from, uh, well, it's actually from Omaha, but it's, it sounds like the uh, Lakota a word, the Sioux. Uh, word ni uh, water and sota clear yeah and you have a, a series of of of, uh, of stative verbs sota shota hota and uh, the the place of articulation of the initial is correlated with the uh, uh, degree of um, murkiness of the water yeah sota clear 
shota less clear and chota quite dirty and, uh, and muddy, yeah? So uh, you have the same kind of phenomena here. It's quite interesting. So you have very white, whitish, and uh, orange, yeah? Well, as you go from a s to a sh to a h to a h, yeah? So uh, very clearly there is a correlation between the main frequency of the onset. So s is clearly when you look at the, you know, look at a um, spectrogram, yeah? The first thing you recognize if it happens to be a language that has an S, a S, is the S, yeah? Even if you are just a, a, a beginner in the spectrum reading, you will be able to read the S, yeah? And uh, that's because they have a very high frequency of, of, uh, um, uh, so of noise, yeah? Now, uh, and, and so uh, if you just uh, you use Prat, Prat or any uh, program and you pronounce the, 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 the fricatives, s, sh, ch, ch, um, it will be easy for you to observe uh, the uh, range of frequency of the noise corresponding to the friction of these different fricatives. And here it seems that the frequency, as uh, uh, it goes from a high frequency to low frequency is correlated with the uh, uh, <coughs> degree of uh, darkness of the color. Yeah? So, and, and that's not specific to this language. Yeah? It's, it reminds quite a lot of, of what we see in Suan languages. Yeah? So I'd like to know whether you have seen things like that. Uh, other things, uh, so here are other examples. Also, um, uh, see, here we have examples with uh, sl, shl, chl, rl, etc. And also, here we can see another phenomenon. We have families of ideophonic roots. So this family uh, with uh, so s, sh, ch, ng, or ang clearly expresses something a white light, yeah, or light or, or something like that. And then you can have ideal fonts that express right and bright and round. Yeah. So these ones that have final ng or ang ng or ang, uh, but instead of having simply s, they have sl or sl clusters. Yeah. And the next family is these ones, which are all round with rl initial. And then you have. And, 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 and some that express us also round, but maybe without this uh, white meaning, like roi, rio, blanc, etc. So here we see something interesting. It, it seems like idiophonic roots. So, for instance, native speakers who are really fluent in the language can create a new ideophones, not simply by uh, taking an idiophonic root and applying productive uh, patterns to it, but they can create idiophonic roots on the fly. And that's something I've observed. They can create idiophonic roots and sometimes merge roots and create these families. Yeah? So um, how do they do that? Yeah. So that's, that's quite puzzling. Yeah, that's what you can observe, but that's quite puzzling. How do they create that? So I have a... Uh, an idea of what may have happened, at least for some ideophonic roots, some uh, look uh, 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 like words that otherwise exist in the language. So I'm going to give a specific example of a family and how it came into being. It's, it's just a hunch, yeah. Uh, uh, more work would be required with more speakers and I, I may not have the, the access now to uh, to to uh, this area, which because of of some issues in China that most of you are aware of, but anyway, I hope that maybe some one day uh, some people will will do it while uh, while the language is still spoken. Look at example thirteen and fourteen. So it it's uh, uh, these are, are taken from text, yeah. Uh, uh, because uh, yeah, it's it's preferable to have um, these ideophonic contexts. So the expression to kneel 
uh, kneel before somebody. Yeah, is expressed by using this noun, khpem, which means the knee, and this verb, pietsho, uh, which means to attack, which can mean to attack. But in fact, it has a, a whole range of meanings. So, um, so here, khpem pietsho. Um, if you remove this zop, your pietsho, it means he kneeled or she kneeled. Yeah. So zo here is a nedefinic root. It's not repeated, so it's pattern one. Yeah, let's have a look at pattern one. Yeah. So it's malfactive. It expresses something that happens immediately, quickly. So here it's used to insist on the sudden character of the action. Yeah. So here, what's interesting is the pronunciation of this idea of zo, which is only used in this expression. It cannot be appear anywhere else. It looks a little bit like tso, does it? And especially tso has an anti-causative form, and zo being be attached. Yeah. Between zo and zo, you only have a, a slight difference in place of articulation. I, I write this uh, other form, zo. Yeah, the anti-causative of tso. So it looks like this ideophone could have originated from the anti-causative of this verb. Yeah. Now look at another way of expressing the same meaning. Yeah. So here we have the same verb and we have which has the same meaning roughly yeah? with the same onset, but a different rhyme. So why would you have such an alternation? Doesn't make sense. Yeah, you don't have alternation anywhere in the language. Now let's have a look. Another in another story, we have this example. Huh? Yeah. So the children who are about to be eaten by the ogre kneel before him to ask for mercy. And here we have a different, uh, no, so it's actually uh, the three, uh, the, I wrote two, but it's the uh, pattern three. So here it, it, it expresses actually, they knelt one after the other. Yeah, it, it, it expresses uh, not just one action, sudden action, but a repetition of similar action. You can imagine the poor children before the ogre and they need one after the other. Yeah. Uh, now, as go, here we see this root is go. Yeah. So the verb is still the same, but the root is go. So we have three roots: zo, zir, and go. Why would you have three roots to express this meaning? And where are they coming from? So one first hypothesis is that. They, the, some speaker long ago created an ideophone, or maybe not so long ago actually, created an ideophone, kneeling, from the anti-causative of the verb used in this collocation, and so anti-causative, yeah? so that's something you can look up, the section on anti-causative, uh, somewhere in a grammar, and modify it a little bit, how? By selecting the plain voice onset. Why? Because in a normal vocabulary, you don't have plain voice onsets. Uh, something I've already said, apart from the. So you shouldn't have a the, yeah? Unless it's a Tibetan long word, yeah? Normally you don't have the initial, yeah? You only have this onset in some Tibetan, very few Tibetan long words and ideal forms. So, in fact, what you're doing here, you take an existing word belonging to the family of the verb of the collocation where the ideophone occurs, and you ideophonicize it by changing the place of articulation of the onset from pre-nasalized onset, which is perfectly normal in this language, to a marked onset, a voiced one, yeah? Now, where... What's the origin of this zir and this go? Now, that's my hunch. Okay, so, but be with me. 
Here is my hypothesis. There are two verbs that are relevant. So zo, this one is the anti-causative of zo, and this azgrsh is a, a verb of Tibetan origin, meaning to bend down. So it's a long word from Tibetan, actually. Yeah. And my hypothesis is that what they did was so ideophonize this root and make to take a, an existing root and make it into an ideal form by changing the place of articulation. Same here. And then they merge, they mix up, you know, the onsets of the two. Yeah. And uh, they end up as got, they end up simplifying the onset. Yeah. Because you have quite a few uh, words with g, words of, of uh, 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 nouns of Tibetan origin. So, for instance, uh, the word for, um, uh, so for instance, uh, what you have, zga, for instance, yeah, the word that means uh, saddle, yeah, one, one way of expressing saddle. Uh, it's not a native word, but you, you have this possibility uh, uh, to, to say zga, zga uh, for saddle. Yeah? So that's a Tibetan word, and you have zga initial. So it's, it's normal for a Tibetan loan word, but words with ge initial are really, really rare. Yeah? So by converting zgo into go, uh, which also exists to express this meaning, you insist on the uh, marked phonological aspect of this ideal form. That, so I suggest that ideal forms can be created by fluent native speakers in a way that no other normal words can by playfully merging roots that happen to have uh, similar meanings, yeah? And occur in collocation related to the meaning of that ideal form, yeah? So it's difficult to demonstrate in a very systematic way, but uh, I think um, it's uh, food for thought, yeah? It also means that ideal forms are very unlikely to preserve ancient features, yeah? they are uh, probably often renewed. Yeah. But the renewing process in itself is extremely interesting yeah, and deserves to be studied in detail in each language. So how do we uh, uh, collect this data? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think the only way to do it correctly is to, uh, to uh, record a lot of texts and uh, elicit additional ideal forms from examples in text. Yeah, you, you take a sentence in a text and you try to modify a little bit and see what different speakers may say. Yeah? And if you happen to be a native speaker of a language with ideal forms, it's, uh, well, don't trust your own instinct too much. Yeah? It's uh, a talk to other native speakers, but I'd love to see uh, similar studies on various languages uh, because I think here, yeah, Ideal forms really uh, differ from the rest of the vocabulary. Yeah. And I, I would uh, be interested to know whether we can have evidence for similar, um, you, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a graft kind of uh, uh, um, evolution of, uh, of ideal forms. Although I would have to say that. Um, the, the so, some words that are created uh, even in English uh, recently uh, uh, are, 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 uh, belong to the same kind of playful use of uh, you know uh, uh, vocabulary. Yeah? Okay. So to, to finish now, I'm, I'm talking about something else. So expressives, one of the most important class of expressives in Gyarong languages are ideal forms, but not all expressives are ideal forms. There are other types of expressing, uh, uh, expressive words. And one of them, uh, uh, well, there's a specific word in French, uh, berger. So in, in English, uh, some people call about summons, maybe there are better terms. So words that are used to communicate with animals, and which um, can be used to call them or chase them. Huh? And uh, Jaroink languages happen to have very um, a a detailed way of expressing that. And actually, uh, so here you can see uh, to call uh, yaks, pigs, sheep, uh, and various animals. And it happens to be 
so uh, so Lai Yufan in his study uh, of Krustia, uh, uh, language also belonging to, to the Gyarong family, found out that some ideal for, uh, some of the summons in Krustiaps were similar to those in Japu, but probably not cognates. Yeah, actually, uh, they, are, they are actually too similar to be cognates. Uh, uh, how they managed to be in these languages, it, the process itself is unknown. But what's remarkable about these ones, they have um, some phonetic features that distinguish not only from the normal vocabulary, but also from ideal forms. So let me give some examples. You have a gold found gold star. So in this Japuk language, you don't have gold star anymore. Yeah. Other Gyarong languages have final gold star, but it was lost in Japuk. But here you can say for, for calling dog, tha, tha, and you clearly have a, 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 a gold star. And those of you who are interested can even listen to it. Uh, I have the, the sound file somewhere. Uh, okay. So this story, I, I just send you the um, DOI. Okay. I, I put the, the link in the chat, or maybe the DOI in the chat. And well, uh, it's, it, it, there's no translation, but at least you can listen to the example of um, uh, 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 of ideal forms, huh? you can uh, identify them. You have also this uh, funny uh, cluster, initial cluster, one, one, one for pigs yeah? with a global sub -word. So of course this exists elsewhere, you know, I'm not claiming it's especially strange, but it's strange for the Japan language. We don't have global stuff and it only ap ap appears in a few examples of summons and you have clicks, yeah. That's not surprising. Even in English, some of summons are include clicks. It's the only uh, place in the language where you have clicks. Yeah. I don't know how it's like in Northeastern India or Nepal. Have you recorded summons? Do they look like ideal forms or not? So uh, these are the kind of question I'm interested in. And I hope that this, um, so I reach here the end of my presentation. I hope that on the one hand, I've uh, managed to uh, uh, to get uh, you interested in into Garong languages. And on the other hand, that you will share with me uh, some interesting data on uh, ideal forms and expressives in the languages you know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Guillaume, for that uh, delightful talk. I think this is something very different from I think what we see in our languages around here. So, uh, and this is, I think, very new uh, for many of the participants. So, yeah, now I think I open uh, time for uh, questions for the participants. Okay, let me take the first privilege. Uh, Zach, uh, this is Hokkien. Ah, okay, so the summons that uh, the last one to begin with the last one, mm -hmm. where in the language, the Zapu, you don't have a glottal stop, but with uh, summons, you have mm -hmm. glottal stop. So I was trying to relate with my language. So it appears to me, but I need to identify that the call, the call for when we call pigs. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have something, no, no, okay. So to my mind, so it also has some, uh, what do you call, uh, pre glottalic release, uh, which mm. is, okay, which is not un uncommon in Tado. Uh, so so your, your language is a Kukichi language, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Which one? Mine is Tado. Ah, uh, Tado, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I yeah. saw your, your publications, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't particularly look at uh, summons, but this mm. uh, this uh, incites me to look further into summons. Mm -hmm. uh, that is one thing. Now, other thing that uh, I wanted to ask is, uh, we have what is called uh, in idiophones or ideophones. So we have what you call ideophones. Some ideophones expresses uh, express uh, positive meaning, while others we have negative yeah. meanings. 
Like Certainly. in your example, there's something like uh, so he did something orderly or disorderly, right? You mm -hmm. have a word for disorderly. And there you have the uh, ideal form, something. So how would you say something like an activity has been done disorderly? So have you tasted that uh, what it was? Negative, positive meaning with orderly, disorderly kind of thing. Have you tried or? Okay, yeah. so maybe disorderly, well, maybe my choice uh, was not felicitous. It, it, it doesn't imply necessarily mm -hmm. um, um, positive or negative meaning, uh, but uh, it, it, it uh, insists on the fact that, uh, for instance, the action uh, uh, presents a, uh, um, a visible or a, a manifest uh, a ch uh, ch uh, um, motion uh, up and down, for instance, or a, a rhythmic motion sometimes, yeah? That, uh, uh, that so it, it uh, yeah, it, 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 it can sometimes express rhythmic motion like that, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, rather than a plain motion. Yeah, the point that I'm trying to make in many of the cookies in languages, at least for Tadao that I work for, mm -hmm. we have something like something that signs uh, brightly and then having a positive meaning. Huh? Like mm, the, sun, okay. the sun signs brightly, then we have pe pe, okay, pe pe, okay, pe pe. And if the signing is not so un is is unpleasant, we have pe pu, pe pu. So do you have such kind of uh, what you call negative meaning? Oh. This the positive the meaning of the, the, the positive and negative meaning being reflected in the uh, I see. Uh, I, 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 no, I, I haven't seen something exactly like that. Yeah, indeed. Okay. It's a bit different. So you have another parameter here. It's interesting. Yeah. It's not something I've seen. And what is uh, uh, something? Uh, okay, the language, even phonologically, it's very, very, very difficult. <laughs> so unusual for many of the Tibetan Roman languages to follow your uh, transcription. So sometimes you get lost with the time. You have lots of what you call gillarized, brutalized, fricative kind of thing, right? Yeah. So but it the... depends difficult for whom. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, for me. Because, <laughs> yeah, uh, because actually uh, some uh, or, or the, some linguists could find, for instance, tones. And uh, so this language doesn't have tone. Uh, and uh, its vowel system is not daunting, yeah? So, uh, you know, some languages have daunting vowel system. This language has clusters, but, uh, well, uh, in, once you've mastered the clusters, the rest is not uh, that difficult, yeah. Okay, lastly, to complement, uh, one of the takeaway uh, is that uh, many of these, uh, what they call idiophones, mm. the meaning even for native speakers, uh, as you said, mm. you cannot go by your own intuition. Sometimes yeah. going by one's intuition, uh, okay, it may work for one or part, two particular words, but for others, that the whole, it can capture a host of, what they call, um, a host of meanings. Yeah. And in that way, uh, depending too much on one's intuition also could. Uh, so the only way you said is uh, to, uh, elicit uh, based on what you call text, if you have a paradigm mm -hmm. in a text, and then how do you uh, elicit further to uh, sitting with other native speakers? Uh, that is the point that I, I really appreciate. Thank you anyway. It's a very Thanks. insightful, insightful uh, talk, and I benefited a lot from it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so if you want to know more, actually, you can uh, read the section on ideal phones in my grammar, from which most of the data here is taken. And also an article I've cited. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, uh, so how do uh, so what are the idiophones? Uh, how do you classify them? Uh, would you classify them as part of the adverbs? Oh well, I I really uh, set up a, a part of speech idiophones. Yeah. Oh, you you, you have set up a, a yeah, part of yeah because there are actually very few adverbs, mm -hmm. but a lot of idiophones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this uh, idea phone uh, transcends across uh, in, uh, multiple what you call grammatical category. That's what you are saying. Not really. No, no. It's they are uh, their own category. This language mm. because they have this morphology. No more is, adverbs do not okay, have this morphology. Okay. So it occurs basically after the verb, or it can occur anywhere. Oh, or, it generally it can be before the verb or after the verb. Uh, uh, very, very rarely they can be used after a noun, but that's okay. extremely rare. What about with uh, adjectives? 
Oh, in this language, adjectives are a subclass of oh, okay, 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 I agree. So it, they include adjectives. Okay, 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 okay. And also adjectives in um, participial form that can serve as attribute to nouns. Yeah. What do you mean but, by, lastly, by, okay, sorry to interrupt. I, I, no, no, what do you please. mean by uh, the, the ideal form? What oh, the ideal form is verbalizing the revision. So I, I, here, maybe I should add verbalizing. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the idiophonic verbs are verbs derived from idiophones. Okay, they are okay. But like I denominal see. verbs are okay. verbs derived from uh -huh. them. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, any more questions? Participants? I've I've got a question. Um Okay. You made the comment about Semitic very early yeah. on, which I think is very yeah. apt because I'm having flashbacks of like Arabic verb forms, but I think having mm -hmm. 10 of them with Roman numerals might have unfairly biased me towards that feeling. Um, yeah. This looks in a way something like, like what we have in Tangsa, but also completely different because we don't have consonant grading or anything like this, but we do have a number of uh, idiophones or however you'd like to call them where there is some sort of sense-based thing, kind of like yeah. what Paul Tang was talking about, about good versus bad. Mm. And in some cases, these are semantically linked. So for example, um, black and bitter and hard and rough can take the same sort of suffixal modifier that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's fire, something like that. Um, and there's one that is vang or vang, which is almost exclusively for verbs, uh, state of mm. verbs, rather adjectives that you would consider positive things, mm -hmm. right? Is there any sort of sense in the form of the clusters that you gave Mm -hmm. where it's either carrying some other semantic meaning that may have been lost mm -hmm. or is simply iconicity. So for example, you had a number that had an R glide on the first slide. I didn't see the second slide very quickly, but on the first slide, you had some with an R glide that tended to be disorderly kind of stuff to bring that word back. Mm -hmm. And you had some that had a J glide for dulled things, right? Like dulled color, soft, mm -hmm. um, smooth, things like this. Is there any sort of sense that this is like an iconicity that's carried over? Are speakers aware of this kind of thing? Is this something that's ever come up? This, it's an ill-formed question. I, no, I think it's, it's probably, uh, th there, there is definitely a phonetic iconicity, uh, not just with the, uh, consonant gradation, but also with some other features. But uh, yeah, I just, it's just very difficult to substantiate. Yeah, uh, of course. But uh, yeah, of course, uh, yeah. I, I would love to see other people even working on Japu can try to do that. Yeah. Maybe there was something there, but it's been completely washed out by now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Again, not unlike Arabic verb yeah. forms, but mm. thank you. Yeah, Sahana yeah, has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, hello. Vezek. So uh I, I want to ask about the pitch in the expressive or like I mm -hmm. words. How how do you find in well that, those that's words? a very good question because yeah. so in Japuk, it just happens that um, it's a language that lost the, the, the tonal contrast of proto dialogic and the, 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 the stress is almost always predictable. Yeah? And uh, uh, ideal fonts, some ideal fonts have the ability to take a special stress, indeed. In, uh, in a, uh, so uh, it's very difficult to see why and uh, the, the function of this uh, stress uh, in ideal fonts, but I, so in my grammar, I give a few examples. And uh, uh, also in my text corpus, I, I've tried to, um, to annotate them. Uh, but uh, so that's something left for further research on Japuk. Yeah, some may hope that some, somebody, uh, I, I really hope that somebody will write an entire dissertation on ideophone in Japuk. Yeah, so because, for yeah. uh, in, in the Pumai, interesting, yeah. all the, all the idiophonic words or expressive words are in low tone, like low, low, oh, low, low, okay. low, low, low. Only they, we can also say in high, high to, to express extremely quick accent oh. when the action is very quick. But in, uh, in, in Nepali, like George Vandram, he talks about that it is always high, high pitch. Mm. So I'm, I'm wondering what, what is the triggering factor in here? So that well, the triggering factor I cannot say, but what you're describing actually are ideophonic patterns. 
So maybe you could try to uh, describe the ideophones in terms of ideophonic patterns in this language. This may include pitch and maybe other uh, features such as uh, duplication, I don't know. Uh, uh, and it could be useful in substantiating a, an independent uh, ideophonic class in this language, which could be nice. Okay, to add up to Seleni, uh, even Thank you. Tado, we have uh, what is called identical tone in the ideophone. If it is oh, high, yeah. high, it's always high. Uh, both, both of them will have high. If it is low, uh -huh. it will be always low. So um, that is one pattern that we I have consistently yeah, observed. Yeah. Yeah, but I think most of many of most of the languages in Northeast we are yet to look closely to these ideophones. So I think it's a very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I hope that you guys will come up with the articles on this topic. I just quickly want to um, mention that um, that the slide that you have given where um, the two. Um, the, the two lexicon they merge and fuse and they become yeah. as a uh, core sure. for bend forward or bend down. I think um, that was the slide. So um, we have in Dimasa also something like okay. that. Uh, we, we use it as gong. So gong is actually to bend down. So, oh, okay. so yeah, this is where uh, I was just observing. So, um, mm. so the, the kind of um, fusion that you have shown here is quite interesting to me because there's every possibility that from gor, um, there's every possibility for the liquids to sound as nasals because that is how it usually happens like luck and become a na. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I found this very interesting because not only idiophones, even um, I have once taken a reference of your um, uh, uh, reflexives or reciprocals in Japuk, and mm. we have the nominal reflexive jar in Dimasa, which is mm. not in any Bodogaro languages or any mm. of the uh, TV languages in Northeast India. So I was wondering where it came from, and I I was having suggestions that um, this is actually from the Indo Aryan um, borrowed from as uh, as in Assamese or in Bangladesh Nije, but in the Indo Aryan they have the apun. Uh, which is the own or self. Mm -hmm. So where did this come in Eastern indo aryan so I was just trying to explore it. And that's when I came across Japuk having the mm -hmm. jar. And that is exactly what we still retain. So I was trying to find it you know, interesting. And I, when I saw these idiophones as well, there's so much of possibility to explore beyond the neighboring languages of this, not only the seven sister states, but also go beyond mm. because what was missing in Northeast, I you know, was actually present in Japuk. So mm. I thought that um, your paper has become an eye opener for so many things to do beyond, mm. not just look into Northeast, but just go beyond and find more features from across those um, Snow Tibetan languages. Yeah. Sorry, is there an a suggestion there, Manali, that you're saying that this gong is an Indo-Aryan loan? So sorry. Were you suggesting uh, that Gong here is an Indo-Aryan loan? Uh, no, no, no. I was okay, uh, okay. saying that the the reflexive uh, Nijay or Nijor. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Got it. Mm -hmm. Gong is in uh, Dimasa. It's, and Tangsa and Kukichin and, and Chinese as well. I mean, yes, Gong yes, is a pretty, yes. pretty stable English, stem yes. for bending. So. Yeah, but yeah. the reflexive jar was uh, I right. found it absent. That is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Thank you. Sorry for misunderstanding. Do you have any more questions? What, what do you think? Maybe I'll just raise uh, one clarification. The, the, the section on summons, uh, is that part of your uh, ideophones? Is that a tent? Well, I don't consider them to be ideophones. Uh, they are expressives. Uh, I, I consider that there are several classes of expressives. One is ideophones, and uh, summons are another category because, as I've shown, uh, summons do not have ideophonic patterns. And uh, they have even more, even stranger phonological properties from the point of view of the system, yeah, than ideal forms. They tend not to have complex clusters, actually, yeah, but they have very strange sounds. Yeah. Okay, let, Next. Me, let me add up uh, one last mm. thing. Uh, mm. uh, this is a general note. So I've been making the claim that uh, 
I, um, I if we talk about endangered languages, so one of the features which is getting loose out in the jungle generation is, uh, is idiophone. One of them is idiophone, not one. So idiophones are no longer because only elderly speaker can associate, huh? native speaker, very fluent. So it's, it comes out uh, so naturally. Mm -hmm. like my children who are born in Delhi, though they speak my Marathi, they will never use any of these idiophones. To them, it doesn't exist in their mm -hmm. <laughs> repertoire. So maybe this aspect of uh, this thing uh, can be soon lost out. Uh, once, yeah, it's uh, the most endangered aspect endangered. because yeah, 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 you can speak the language fluently without yeah. knowing them. Yeah, yeah. Just you, you speak a watered down version of the language. And the, uh, competence, it, it, the competence of a speaker can be judged based on how fluently exactly. you use because it, it adds extra flavor, not ordinary yeah. flavor. It adds a host of extra flavor to the language. And yeah. once this, uh, what do you call this, uh, so ingredient uh, delicious uh, item in the language is lost. The, the beauty of the language we, might be lost, but- uh, the, Indeed, the, yeah. so, so indeed we have to preserve ideophones for, <laughs> to preserve the language, to preserve the interest in speaking this language. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, so do we have any more questions? Yeah, if not, I'm going to thank uh, our speaker once again, Dr. Yong Jacques, for that enlightening talk. And uh, yeah, thank you to all the participants uh, for being with us this uh, session. I'll hand over, I think, to whom? Uh, Bijan or Konali? Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Temsu, for smoothly chairing the session of. Uh, Dr. Kim Jack, and we are very happy and we are very happy and thankful to have uh, Dr. Guillaume Jack, and he has presented a very elaborative, exhaustive and informative uh, session on the idiophones uh, in Jafuk and other uh, Yalrongik language. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing it properly. Sorry for that. So anyway, thank you very much and all the participants who have you know, given their time for this session. So we look forward all you to be in the days to come, tomorrow and day after. Tomorrow again, we are starting our session from 9 a.m. onwards. So with this note, we close today's session. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you, one and all. Yeah, before we close, yes, uh, yes, just please. one uh, okay. reminder oh, sorry, sorry. that we need to take a group photo. All right. Yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. All the participants, we request you to kindly turn on your video so that we can have a virtual photo session. Okay. It was a very hectic day, but indeed so enjoyable. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. This um, Jacques' talk was really, really intriguing. I really enjoyed it a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are still waiting for uh, the rest of the participants to turn on your videos. Yeah, if your situation permits you to turn on your video. Okay. Uh, all right. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Munali, uh, is there any announcement uh, from your end? Uh, there is no such announcement. Uh, tomorrow's session, all the presenters have confirmed. Okay. Um, there is no change in the uh, first session, and it will be chaired by Mimi Izum. Um, so it starts straight away at nine. So pre presenters are requested to be there at least 10 to 15 minutes before the time so that we can arrange the uh, PPT screen sharing and audio and all those. Thank you once again. And thank you, okay. Dr. Guillaume Jack, for being here with us. And thank you to all the participants. It was a wonderful session. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Okay, bye-bye.